Good morning. I say to a room mostly full of furniture, these are strange days, but these are good days. It is nice for at least the small number of us who are here to get to hear Daryl in person again. And I have hope that as we move forward into this winter, we might be able to be together in larger numbers. This is a season for looking back and a season for telling the truth. So tomorrow is Columbus Day, Indigenous Peoples Day, National Coming Out Day. So in this moment, I invite us all to tell the truth about who we are and how we got here and where we're going. So come, let us gather humans and furniture and everyone. Come, let us look back and let the stories of how we got here guide us forward. Come, let us worship together. I'm Chris Mesroche, and I'm uh, part of the Sunday service uh, committee. And uh, I always see my job these Sundays as trying to make things go as smoothly as possible. And so all this dangerous furniture here just makes me nervous. But uh, <laughs> uh, I want to welcome everybody here who's in person. I would like to welcome everybody here who is online. If this is your first time coming, please um, uh, email or uh, call the church, get to know us. That's kind of probably the best way to reach out and to learn about our community. Stay on afterwards for the, uh, the coffee half an hour and uh, get to know us uh, individually that way. And um, I would just like to say uh, welcome to everybody and um, you know, welcome to our great service. If you are at home, we invite you to sing with us. This is Rise Up, O Flame. Rise up, O flame, by thy light glowing, show to us beauty, vision, and joy. Rise up, O flame, by thy light glowing, Show to us beauty, vision, and joy. Rise up, O flame, by thy light glowing. Show to us beauty, vision, and joy. Vision and joy. Why a flaming chalice, the question comes. It's the cup of life, we answer. A cup of blessings overflowing. A cup of water to quench our spirit's thirst. A cup of wine for celebration and dedication. The flame of truth, the fire of pur pur purification. Oil for anointing, healing. Out of chaos, fear, and horror, thus was the symbol crafted a generation ago. So it may be for us in these days of uncertainty, sorrow, and rage, and a light to warm our souls and guide us home. Today is our first Sunday of religious education classes. And traditionally, we would invite all of our teachers to stand on the steps and we would celebrate them. And because of these days, we cannot. Our teachers are already out teaching outside to our children under 12 who are too young to be vaccinated or inside 
to our older children who are vaccinated. And so we are creating new rituals and new ways to celebrate our teachers in these times. So first we have a video that Diane Melvin made explaining what our religious education program is this year. So Reed, I invite you to, to share that with us. Hello, I'm so excited that we get to offer some gratitude for all of our religious education volunteers. At this time, I'm super excited that we are finally having our first in-person religious education class in a year and a half, uh, outdoors and masked. We're hoping to mitigate uh, safety and be able to have connection and it would not be possible if, without all of the volunteers that make it happen our preschool volunteers are doing a natural wonders curriculum with our youngest kids and we've got our keepers of the earth volunteers leading our first through sixth graders with outside environmental activities and connecting with nature on our beautiful grounds We've got our OWL class for middle school um, taking place with 15 youth and our high school volunteers teaching our high school class. We are so fortunate that these folks are willing to um, add additional responsibilities on top of their work and their families and their other responsibilities to serve our congregation. Uh, by dedicating time to our children and our youth. Um, and these most unusual times, um, we, instead of giving them a big round of applause, we are going to offer them gratitude through a word menti cloud. So I'm thankful that we can find new, unique, and creative ways to connect and to say thank you to those people that have given so much of their time. Um, I don't want to forget the RE committee who has uh, done an enormous amount of work this summer to get ready for RE to start this fall. So thank you to everyone. Thank you to this congregation. And um, I look forward to seeing all the words that you put into your Menti Cloud to thank our RE volunteers. Thanks. So we, we generally dedicate our teachers with a responsive reading where they make promises to care for our children, to learn alongside them, to be challenged and to challenge. And today, we are just going to offer them blessings. They are not here to make promises. So I believe we, Reed is going to share a word cloud to those of you who are with us on Zoom. And those of you who are here in person, if you have, have a device on you, you can go to the website www.menti.com -E and type in the code seven six seven three eight six nine one and type in a word or two of blessing and if you are on zoom you can type that into the chat and we will make it there if you are one of the few who are here in person and don't want to bother with the phone uh, you can you can just tell me the word and we will gather up all of these these blessings on our teachers as they try this new big kind of wild thing of being entirely outside um, and make sure they, they receive them from all of you.
So we can see that word cloud grow and change and it will continue to. Um, we can see things come in on the chat and we will pass along all of this care and support to our teachers. People's people are generous people. You are generous in so many ways in, in volunteering to make our religious education happen and sharing your gifts of music with the congregation. And I think your generosity is on very clear display in the commons right now, which is full of things donated to help our soon to be Afghan neighbors make a home and make a life here. So our, our few number of people who are here in person are, I think, all sitting on donated furniture that will soon be in someone else's house. And in addition to gathering up furniture and other other goods, the Sunday or the Social Justice Committee has invited people's people to give financially to support the work of Samaritas and Bethany Christian Services as as they make a way for our soon to be neighbors, for people who who supported our country's efforts in Afghanistan and who are no longer safe remain there. So now I would like to introduce Afifa Thaj from Samaritas, who will talk to us for a few minutes about their good and important work. I invite you all to give as generously as you are able. Hello, everyone. Glad to meet you all over Zoom. And I know, uh, you know, it's been a pleasure to meet you all and partner up with People's Church with the amazing amount of support that we have been receiving with the furniture storage and also with some volunteers who are constantly like, you know, trying to update everybody regarding the needs of the Afghan families and other refugees coming to Kalamazoo. And thank you all for doing that. And um, I am Afifa Taj from Samaritas. My, I do, I've been involved with Samaritas for the past five years. And uh, so I know I had been working very close with uh, uh, Anne Feldmayer uh, with the first refugee, um, Syrian refugee family that came to Kalamazoo. The, I think I should say they were the second family that came. And it was a pleasure working with her and the rest of the group as well. Um, so uh, now we have the need is for the Afghan refugees. Samaritas has signed up for 120 people to be resettled in Kalamazoo area, which could uh, possibly increase to 150, depending on the demand that we have a request that has been made from different uh, army base to support these uh, people in the resettlement process over here. And so far we have received around um, three families. It, the first family that came was a family of three siblings. One was 18 and then 16 and then a 14 year old. Since the 18 year old was a considered an adult, uh, so it was considered as a family and released uh, to for Samaritas to resettle those three kids. Um, then the second family that came was just two days ago. It's a family of six and they, uh, they're all well educated people. And um, so they speak English, which was an added advantage for all of us to communicate with them. Uh, then there is another family who's a single mom with a four-year-old who has arrived. She doesn't speak any English, but we have good volunteers. And, you know, one of uh, our supervisor who's Aram, he also, he speaks many languages. So it was a very great help uh, in welcoming these refugees because he was able to speak their language and welcome them to Kalamazoo. Plus we had unaccompanied minors who were resettled by Bethany, who have become like experienced for the past four years 
and they have been a great help in welcoming them and they have been calling me to tell uh, to let me know that there are there are available timings to help in whatever way they could and um, so it's amazing to see how people are coming forward uh, even from their own culture as well as the rest of the Kalamazoo community, which is amazing to see all the churches, synagogues, mosques, everybody coming together to help uh, these people to have a smooth transition in their resettlement. So the needs that we have is one of the needs is being met by people's church is you know the storage place that we needed to, uh, though we had a lot of people calling in for donations, but we didn't have a place to store. And so it was a great help to have uh, People's Church and a Prince of Peace Church. And now we have Congregation of Moses who also partnered up with Samaritas for storage. And it's just not storage. It's the uh, amazing work of the volunteers who are constantly going through this uh, pile of donations and sorting through it and making sure that every family gets all the uh, basic needs that they have. And it's a great help. Now what we are looking for is like, you know, any financial donation from the people uh, from people would help them uh, with their resettlement process because these people, thank God, uh, just last week, we came to know that, you know, these people all would be eligible for state benefits and refugee resettlement program, which wasn't the case a week before. So we were all worried how this is going to happen because the federal money that they get only one time is $1,200. And with that, it's not enough even to, you know, in two months rent, they're out of that money if it's family of two. So, but now uh, with uh, the state, uh, with, the, with these people, I mean, eligible for the state benefits, which is food stamps and medical insurance, uh, it makes it a little more easier for all of us to get them resettled here. And um, so any amount, any money that's been donated would be going towards their rental um, to meet their rental needs because it's going to take a while for them to get their employment authorization cards. So until then, they won't be able to start working. So, you know, we are always looking for leads for uh, house renting the houses, renting apartments, and, um, and also small groups that could help with their transition, being a school liaison, being a grocery shopper with them, since they don't have transportation to go to medical appointments, um, then uh, just a person to socialize with them but because they don't know where the parks are when they have kids, where to take them. Uh, just uh, so uh, being a social friend would help a lot more in getting them acclimated to the US culture. Uh, so it's a great help which I'm sure Anne, Anne can talk for, to, for that, that you know, it's a great adjustment for these families coming from their country, not knowing the language, not knowing the culture, leaving everything. And sometimes they have this, um, uh, you know, the uh, trauma that they've gone through and it's sometimes they get depressed. So people over here, when they visit them, they see, they just, you know, talk to them, just talking to them makes them feel more happier and uh, get back to their routine. So the needs that we have is for volunteering. Please come forward to make groups to volunteer and uh, donate generously so that we can use that money for their, uh, any help that they need that the agency and the government assistance is not able to help with it. So your money, your donation would be used in the uh, right sense to help them uh, resettle here. And thank you all once again for listening to me, taking your time and partnering up with Samaritas for storage and volunteering with everything and updating the congregation with all the needs that Samaritas has. Thank you, thanks. When dreams
Trees are turning, chimney smoke is curling, fallen leaves are swirling. I'll be coming home when geese are wending, apple branches bending when the sun. Please join me in the giving thanks for all that sustains us. From the countless gifts we each have been given, gifts of life and love and sustenance, we bring these small portions to share in the works of love which none of us can accomplish alone. People's Church is a community that supports one another in good times and hard times and all the times. One of the ways that we do that is by taking time during our service to share the joys and sorrows and milestones of our lives with one another. So if you have a joy, a sorrow, another milestone you'd like to share, I invite you to share it. If you are on Zoom, that means typing it into the chat box. If you are here, you can come and speak into our microphone. And, um, and if you have something in your heart that you don't, is too precious to, to name out loud today, I invite you to place a stone or ask for a stone and we will put a stone into our bowl of water for you. And I will pause our recording as well. May I be filled with loving kindness. May I be well. May I be filled with 
with loving kindness. May I be well, may I be peaceful and at ease. May I be whole, may you be filled with loving kindness. The Chalice of Our Being by Richard S. Gilbert. Each morning we hold out our chalice of being to be filled with the graces of life that abound, air to breathe, food to eat, companions to love, beauty to behold, art to cherish, causes to serve, they come in ritual procession, these gifts of life. Whether we deserve them, we cannot know or say. They are poured out for us. Our task is to hold steady the chalice of our being. We carry the chalice with us as we go, either meandering aimlessly or with destination in our eye. We share its abundance, if we have any sense, reminding others as we remind ourselves of the contents of the chalice we don't deserve. Water from living streams fill it. If only we hold it out faithfully. We give back if we can. Something of ourselves, some love, some beauty, some grace, some gift. We give back in gratitude if we can. Something like what is poured into our chalice of being for those who abide with us and will follow. Each morning, we hold out the chalice of our being to receive, to carry, to give back. Spilling the Light by Teresa Nina Soto. Some people are used to keeping rules. Don't cross the streets when the light is red, only sensible. It turns out that keeping rules isn't the same as keeping covenant, which asks us instead of keeping a bright line to keep our promises. To what have we promised ourselves? To this moment in time and peace, to this community and even tenderly interconnected this planet. We promise ourselves to the idea that we are each and all human beings. We promise that there is something moving between us that we cannot tame and cannot measure. The chalice is a reminder that what flame we keep inside us cannot light the way. The light must spill to shine. The thing you must be is yourself, unadulterated, shedding the willingness 
to journey alone as though you are made of something hard and unforgivable. You are only human. You belong right here, right now. And together we will chase away the sickness, the secrets, and leave only the open possibilities that the future is a space for growth. And together we chase away the sickness, the secrets, and leave only the open possibility that the future is a space for growth. Back from the Fields by Peter Everwine. Until nightfall, my son ran in the fields looking for God knows what. Flowers, perhaps, odd birds on the wing, something to fill an empty spot. Maybe a luminous angel or a country girl with a secret dark. He came back empty handed or so I thought. Now I find them, thistles, goat heads, the barbed weeds, all those with hooks or horns, the snaggle toothed, the grinning ones, those wearing lantern jaws, old ones in beards, leapers in silk leggings, the multiple pocked moons and spiny satellites, all those with juices, and saps like the fingers of thieves, nation after nation of grasses that dig in, that burrow, that hug winds and grab handholds in whatever lean place. It's been a good day. Why a chalice, the question comes. Why do we begin so many of our gatherings, worship, classes, meetings, and more with the ritual of lighting a flaming chalice inside, or flame inside a chalice? How did this become the symbol of Unitarian Universalism? It's a long story. <laughs> settle in. It's also a story that I've told before. So some of my words today are borrowed from a sermon I preached about five and a half years ago. But the scholarship has evolved. And I don't expect anybody to remember what I preached five and a half years ago, if you were even part of our community then. So today we'll be journeying through time as I tell you the history of the chalice. So let's climb in our time machine and set the dial for the early years of the 15th century for our first stop. Our destination is Prague, Central Europe, and what was then Bohemia. So we step out of our time machine and onto the campus of Prague University. We wander into a lecture hall, and the lecturer is Jan Hus, a Catholic priest and the Dean of the Philosophy Faculty. He was speaking ab about his ideas for reforming the church. So this was before the Reformation. So the Roman Catholic Church was the primary church in Western Europe. And Father Hus thought the church, his church, should be doing things differently. Somehow Hus had come across a banned book and incorporated many of its ideas. This was before the printing press, and so banned books were precious and rare and had to be hand copied for the most part. So Hus read this book and called the church to reform. He believed that the mass, the religious service, should be said in Czech, the language that the people who were attending mass should, could understand, rather than Latin. He also believed that the congregation should eat the bread and drink from the chalice full of wine during the communion ritual. Remember that the chalice is part of communion. At that point, only the priest drank the wine. He opposed religious wars and the selling of indulgences to pay for them. 
Indulgences in Catholic practice are a way to reduce the punishment for sins. Indulgences can include saying prayers and performing acts of service. At service. And in the era of Hus, indulgences healed corruption because the rich could buy them and purchase their way out of punishment and purgatory in the afterlife. Selling indulgences enriched the church. And this practice angered many of the earliest reformers of the church, including Jan Hus and Martin Luther. So perhaps Hus was attacking one of these practices in the lecture we hear. And when we leave the university and speak to others, because we all can speak Czech at this point in our story, we learn that Hus is wildly popular among his people. His proposed reforms unite Czechs across class differences and other divisions and add to a growing nationalist movement there. And the chalice became the symbol of those who supported Hus. It wasn't a chalice with a flame like we have, just a chalice, the chalice that held the wine that Hus thought the people should drink, not just the priests. And those of you who know anything about the history of religious descent in the <laughs> can guess, the story of Jan Hus does not end well. In 1413, a church council ordered his writings be burned. The following year, he was imprisoned and tried for heresy. And he told his accusers that he would recant his beliefs if they could show him proof in the Bible that his beliefs were wrong. And they did not engage that line of argument. He died for his beliefs. He was burned at the stake in 1415. Eventually though, Hus won the argument. About 50 years after his death, the church reinstated the practice of the laity drinking from the chalice of wine during communion. A century after that, the church abolished the selling of indulgences and the Roman Catholic Church started saying mass in the local language in the 1960s. He was just 500 years early. So now we're stepping back into our time machine to jump centuries into the future. We speed across time and we see Hus's Hus legacy unfold and fast forward before us. We see that Hus, Hus's martyrdom led his followers to form their own church, known as the Hussites or the Chalice people. They were among the first Protestants before Protestants was a thing that people could be. It was before that word had been invented. But these Chalice people opposed violence, political repression, the death penalty. They refused to be conscripted into the military. And when they served communion, the congregation ate bread and drank wine from the chalice. As the centuries speed along, the Hussites factionalize and splinter. Hus's religious heirs call themselves by many names, and there are intergroup fights and religious wars and antagonisms and agreements with the Catholic Church. Many of the groups fade away. So as we travel across the centuries, we see that the only Hussite group that survives until the present is the Moravian Brethren Church, a small Protestant church with about 750,000 members globally. Their church motto is something I like, and I think it speaks to all of us. It says, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, and all things, love. So let's pause to notice that we, as Unitarian Universalists, are not the descendants of the Hussites. Jan Hus is not our direct spiritual ancestor, though many of his ideas informed the people that became our people. So how did we end up with his symbol as part of our own? So for that, I need to take you to another time and place in our time machine. We are headed to Portugal in 1941. We are all crowded into the Lisbon office of the Reverend Charles Joy, a Unitarian minister who was serving as the European commissioner of the Unitarian Service Committee. 
He was tasked with assisting refugees and other victims of the Second World War, which included Czech Unitarians, Jews, artists, dissidents, others. Dan Hotchkiss describes the context and the challenge. The USC was an unknown organization in 1941. This was a special handicap in the cloak and dagger world, where establishing trust quickly across barriers of language, nationality, and faith could mean life instead of death. Disguises, signs, and counter signs, and midnight runs across guarded borders were the means of freedom in those days. The Unitarian Service Committee issued travel documents to those fleeing the war who had lost their documents on the way. These travel papers certified that the refugees were safe for resettlement and they needed to look trustworthy. These documents needed to look official and in part they needed a logo. So Reverend Joy needed a logo so he asked a local artist Hans Deutsch to design one. Deutsch was born in Austria and had been living in Paris during Hitler's rise to power. He had published cartoons critical of Hitler. So when France was invaded, he fled to neutral Portugal. There, he took on a commission from the Unitarian Service Committee. He designed an, a logo. He borrowed that old Czech chalice, a symbol of resistance and freedom, and adapted it to this new era and new challenge. He added a flame. The symbol that Deutsch designed was a flaming chalice, similar to what we use today. Reflecting later, Joy said, Joy said that he asked Deutsch to create a symbol for their papers to make them look official, to give dignity and importance to them, and at the same time to symbolize the spirit of our work. When a document may keep a man out of jail, give him standing with governments and police, it is important that it look important. Communication was poor in those days, and it would have taken too long for Joy to get official approval for the new logo from the American headquarters of the Unitarian Service Committee. So he decided to seek forgiveness rather than permission and approved Deutsch's logo and started using the symbol on official documents. He wrote back to headquarters, I've had it made up into a seal, not because I have any idea of forcing this upon the committee without consulting them, but because these things cost very little and at least it will serve as a te temporarily expedient. He then went on to explain the symbolism. I think it might well become the sign of our work everywhere. It represents, as you see, a chalice with a flame, the kind of chalice which the Greeks and Romans put on their altars. The holy oil burning in it is a symbol of helpfulness and sacrifice. So Joy helped, hoped that the Unitarian Service Committee might make the chalice the symbol of their work. That hope was borne out. The flaming chalice logo became first a symbol of the Unitarian Service Committee. And then after the Unitarians and the Universalists became one, Association, the Unitarian Universalist Association. So there are a few interesting details in this story I wanna highlight. First is that Deutsch, the man who gave us our flaming chalice was not a Unitarian. There's no record that he ever attended a Unitarian service and yet he gave us our symbol. He admired our religious commitment to save refugees and other victims of the Second World War he wrote, I am not what you may actually call a believer, but if your kind of life is the profession of your faith, as it is, I feel sure, then religion, ceasing to be magic and mysticism, becomes confession to practical philosophy, and what is more, to active, really useful social work. And this religion, with or without a heading is one to even which a godless fellow like myself can say wholeheartedly, yes. Another detail, one which I learned recently, is that it is likely that Hans Deutsch used a similar logo for another project a few years ago. 
Their Crisis was a magazine founded by a group of lesbians and gay men in Switzerland in 1933. A decade later, the leadership had and focus of the magazine had shifted entirely to gay men and their literary works. So those leaders wanted a new logo and they commissioned an artist and they received, they have an image that is very much like our chalice. The historical record is spotty and so I can't say for sure if it was Hans Deutsch who was the designer of that logo as well, because almost everyone who worked with that magazine used a fake name. But the timing and Deutsch's social connections make many UU historians who've looked into this much closer than I have believe it to be true. I think that's a really interesting connection. I think it's also worth highlighting that the chalice was a logo first, not, not an object, not a ritual. And so we kind of like the logo evolved into a practice, which generally logos reflect things that are already happening rather than kind of launching a group on a new path, which is just an interesting story. So let us climb back into our time machine and return to the present day. So the, the flaming chalice turns from logo to ritual. The Unitarian Service Committee, then later the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee had the chalice logo for decades before kindling a chalice flame became something people do in worship, became a standard ritual at the beginning of so much of what we do. Children's classes, youth groups, and women's small groups were lighting a chalice flame by the early 1960s. And it is believed that the first time that a chalice was lit in worship was in 1965 by youth at the Christmas Eve service at West Shore Unitarian Church outside Cleveland, Ohio. From there, the practice spread. From our time machine, we see that by the 1970s, the chalice was becoming a widely understood symbol of our faith. In 1984, a chalice was lit in worship for the first time at, at the UUA General Assembly, which is the national gathering for business and worship and learning held annually. And so now we can pop back in our time machine and come back to this moment, <laughs> whether you like it or not, I guess. What have we learned in our journey? We have learned that the history of the chalice as a religious symbol is long. And lighting a chalice at the beginning of worship and other gatherings is very new among us. Why did it catch on so quickly? I think this is a testament to the power of ritual and the power of symbol. Lighting a chalice at the beginning the beginning of something is a uniquely Unitarian Universalist practice. No one else does this, and nearly every Unitarian Universalist community does. It's one of it's really the only ritual that's part of Sunday morning that is ours and only ours. Everything else, someone else is also doing at the same moment. The lighting a chalice binds us together across distance and division. It's something we've been doing at home during this time when we can't worship together in person. And we see in our chat how a chalice is lit in all of these different places in our community. The flaming chalice binds us together, becomes a symbol because it is rich. The cup and the fire are rich symbols. So a chalice cup brims with meanings. And then when I think about its history, I, the image that I read in that poem about the child running through a field and picking up all of these brambles and seed pods comes to mind. There are things that cling to us because of where we've been, because of our collective history, even if we individually aren't aware of them. So what, what does a flaming chalice mean to you? What piece of its history resonates for you today? The chalice can be the Christian communion cup of Jan Hus, 
a cup that he believed everyone should drink from and share. It can be the cup placed on Greek and Roman altars or a flame of helpfulness and sacrifice, as Charles Joy wrote during the Second World War. It can be the cup of community, the cup of connection, the cup of compassion. The flaming chalice image became ours through our work to help people fleeing the Nazis during World War II. That history feels especially important to me today as I preach to a room full of things donated to help Afghans resettle here as we asked you to give money to help our partners in this work. We are living into our legacy by continuing this work of resettling people who cannot stay safely where they live. You can also look at the chalice on this pulpit or burning here and see a logo shared with a Swiss magazine from the middle of the last century by and for gay men. And while that history is murky, we can see its echoes in our commitment to the inherent worth and dignity of every person. And how we put that into practice by encouraging everybody to live the truth of who they are. Some communities, I think, would be scandalized by that association. And I think most of us are delighted by it. And that means something. And even if we don't know that particular history, we see ourselves carrying it forward by our partnerships with Outfront and others, by being a safe place for so many of our children and youth to be who they truly are. One of the beautiful things about a symbol is that it can mean all of those things and more all at the same time. The chalice cup and flame can hold all anything we wish it to mean almost. And that meaning shifts for us over time and from day to day. So what did it mean to you when we lit this chalice today? And it will probably mean something different the next time and the next time and the next time. Each of us brings our own understandings. And that is the sign of a good ritual, but it doesn't mean only one thing. It holds complexity. We don't have to agree on what it means before we light the chalice. We do it and revel in the reality that it can hold all of it and all of us together in community. So I invite you as we close to take a moment and just look at this chalice flame. What does it mean today? And what might it grow into meaning as we jump ahead in our time machine and see Unitarian Universalists lighting a chalice decades from now? So may our flaming chalice remind us of Jan Hus and his commitment to the truth. May our flaming chalice renew our commitments to care for people seeking safety then and now. May our flaming chalice re-energize us to live our mission, to be a church that is a beloved community, embracing and serving our diverse world. May we carry forward our legacy of resistance and compassion. May it be so. May we make it so. And amen. This little light of mine seems appropriate. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it 
shine, let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Building up a world, I'm gonna let it shine. Building up a world, I'm gonna let it shine. Building up a world, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Oh, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. So as we close today, I hope that knowing a bit more of where we come from and how we came to the practices that are ours will help each of us see ourselves as part of a history, a history of compassion, a history of truth telling, a history of caring for those who need care. And I invite us to step into that powerful legacy and go out into the world to do the work of love. May we go in peace and go in love. Mm -hmm.